Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. Have you ever gotten into trouble? So bad a trouble that maybe you had to have a time out or maybe go to your room for a while? And you were kind of scared because somebody was really angry with you at what you did and you were wondering what was going to happen? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. And sometimes, you know, when you're scared like that, you just really need a big hug. That's why it's good to have a teddy bear, because teddy bears are always available for a hug, no matter what's going on, and especially when you're kind of not sure what is happening and you're scared. That's kind of what happens with us, doesn't it? That's exactly what happens with us. When God looks at us as sinful people, he hates sin. He does not like it at all, and somebody needs to be punished because of that. And if we're punished because of our sin, there's nothing we can do. So he sent Jesus. Jesus came and lived a perfect life. He never did anything wrong. His mom and dad never had to get after him for anything. And he gives us credit for that. So when we're scared because we think God might be mad at us, we know that we have Jesus as our Savior who gives us a big hug and says, I have paid for that sin. When I died on the cross, I took your sins away. That's why we have this big cross back here to remind us what Jesus did. You see Jesus carrying his cross over in that window? He died there and took every one of our sins away. And now he rose again, and he lives in heaven, making a place for us to come and live. What a great thing. And he is always available with a big hug that tells us we are forgiven. Let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and living a perfect life, for taking our sins to the cross and then rising, everything done perfectly, and now ready to fold us in your arms with your saving love and be with us every day. Help us to tell others about that as we live here on earth and look forward to the day when we get to come to be with you forever. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Holy Gospel for the second Sunday of Easter is John chapter 20. This morning, just reading verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples came together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. This is the gospel of our Lord. <coughs> Traditionally, on this week after Easter, we focus on the story of Doubting Thomas, how he was not there uh, the, the night of Easter, but he was there a week later. This morning, we're only focusing on the first two verses of that account, especially on the miracle of Jesus appearing and the message, peace be with you. But we begin in the locked room, and there are ten of the disciples who are there huddled. They're afraid, and the doors are locked, and Jesus is about to appear. But John tells us, first of all, that they were there on account of the fear of the Jews or Jewish leaders. This was a fear, probably a reasonable one, that if the Jews and Romans had come after the leader, that they would now come after the followers. Although we should say that John himself had been openly present there at the crucifixion and had not been arrested. And Matthew tells us in his gospel that the high priest had bribed the guards to lie about Jesus' body having been, having been stolen. But then we also remember that the lot, that lie had been told this very day and had the disciples even heard about it yet. Um, and I, I should also say that recently uh, I made a mistake in my Tuesday Bible class. Uh, both the morning and the evening session uh, I, I, I asked about this uh, bribe and this lie that the, the soldiers had fallen asleep. And uh, the class had wondered if the soldiers would get in trouble for losing the body of Jesus the way that they would uh, lose their lives if they lost a prisoner. And 
uh, my response was that Jesus wasn't a prisoner. He was a dead body and therefore more of a thing to be guarded and not a person to be guarded in the, in the eyes of the Romans. Um, and although that kind of stood with most of the Bible class, I, this week, reading uh, something by a former member of St. Paul's, Professor Lyle Lang, um, I'm led to understand that the Roman soldiers would also be put to death if they fell asleep on duty. Uh, and therefore, from that point of view, the entire lie that the high priest was trying to tell becomes unraveled at every single thread. None of the lie makes sense at all. But the, finally, the reason for the locked door is unimportant. It's only the fact of the locked door that really matters to us because it means that it gave an opportunity for our Savior to perform a miracle by suddenly appearing when, humanly speaking, nobody could have gotten into that room. There were 10 and then there were 11. There is Jesus among them. And the New Testament is filled with the faith of the apostles uh, putting their uh, a faith in Jesus because he came to life again. Real, physical life in the resurrection. And the, the proof of all of the eyewitnesses, especially lined up in last week's epistle lesson, which is 1 Corinthians 15, and all of those different resurrection appearances. But it's the same kind of historical truth, the resurrection of Jesus, as was the birth of Jesus or the crucifixion of Jesus, just as true and as real as the birth or death of anyone in the world. Jesus was, and then to their grief he was not, and now to their inexpressible joy he was again alive with them. He was speaking and smiling and talking and eating and drinking with them. And he had this message, peace be with you. In Greek, just two words, but a blessing, a benediction to them. Peace is upon you. Peace be with you. This is the real peace of the human conscience soothed in the medicine of the forgiveness of sins. Trust in God. It is true spiritual peace. The opposite, of course, is a disturbed, troubled conscience, a lack or absence even of trust in God, which is unbelief. And the penalty for such a bad conscience is described in the first Psalm, where David says, it is like the chaff that the wind blows away. Or as God told Moses, I will make them so afraid at the sound of a wind-blown leaf that it will get them running. This is the fear that sin always brings with it. Whatever the sin might be, uh, coveting or gossiping or uh, cheating or a little hatred or lusting for whatever you don't have but imagine that you maybe deserve, it is the failure, finally, it is the failure to submit to God's will, to, to be unwilling to be subordinate to God. It is the desire that we have to tell God how he could be doing a better job. What more sinful servants could God have than us, than me? These attitudes that we have, the, the pattern of thinking that we know better than God does, this should bring us fear and it should bring us finally to terror. We understand that we're saved, but then there is this new little path that we're led down by a hissing voice that wants to say, well, if you're saved, then don't worry so much about this new sin because the devil always wants us to, to try out rebellion. And he lies about, oh, it worked for this person in the past, worked for that person in the past, and the answer is it doesn't work for anybody ever. New or old, innovative or an old standby sinful habit, the devil doesn't care, but it brings us fear, beginning with the fear of hell. The scriptures paint a, a terrible picture of hell, a place of eternal suffering without relief, 
without companionship, without help, without friendship, a suffering that therefore is endured all alone in pain, unrelenting pain and thirst, very much like what our Savior suffered on the cross. And that sinner is, is led to understand, I deserve this for my sin. <clears throat> and if I don't turn back from this path of repeated sin that I'm on, God may actually damn me to hell forever. But that maybe, maybe his, in his compassion, he will use things in my life to turn me back. And how terrible, but on the other hand, how wonderful uh, for God to call me back in repentance through trouble in my life. Like the disciples' fear of the Jewish leaders or the fear that God might cause uh, disease or death or upheaval in one's life to make one think about what am I doing and how or should I turn back to Christ? What if, for example, what if God would, would ruin, thoroughly ruin or allow to be ruined uh, a woman's reputation for the rest of her life in order that just one single solitary good might be accomplished through that, the one good above all, that her soul might be saved. To turn a human being away from sin and doubt and mistrust, to live a life for Christ, to trust in him and to show our faith in him and to put that trust and faith into action through what we do and how we say no to temptation to turn away from sinful habits and, and convenience, and then to whisper the words our Savior prayed, not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus comes. As he came to the disciples through the miracle of the locked door, and he comes to us through the miracles of holy baptism and his real presence, in, in, the, in, the, in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, all for the forgiveness of our sins, to turn us to faith in him and to re-energize and, and, and uphold and lift up that faith to turn us from death to life. <coughs> and notice how he offers proof. He commands 10 pairs of eyes to look at his hands and at his side and in another gospel, in Luke, to look at his feet as well. There was a time, relatively speaking, not that long ago, when critics of the Bible, who always want to find some, some new way for, to cast doubt for Christians on the Word of God, that they denied that Jesus could possibly have been crucified also in his feet, because they said that just wouldn't work, the nails wouldn't hold, and so forth. And there were even some papers written about this and some famous paintings that were made where the feet of Jesus and the other criminals are shown to be simply dangling below the cross and, and, and not nailed there, either together or side by side. And, and until finally, some archaeologists found the, the bones of a human foot from Roman times with a nail driven through them, exactly as it would be in crucifixion. Uh, from, from, from all that time ago in a grave and therefore uh, proving that it, that it can happen exactly as the Bible said it did happen. And now critics have to look for some other way to cast doubt on the Bible as they will, just as the high priest looked for and bribed his way into spreading doubt. But Jesus brings us peace, the opposite of doubt, the peace that is offered to all. Believers have it, knowing that our sins are forgiven in Christ. <coughs> the eyewitnesses had it, having seen him for themselves with their own eyes. And in the resurrection, we will all still have it, and we will possess it flawlessly and forever. The grace of God sent Jesus to pay the penalty for each one of our sins. The grace of God sends faith into our hearts through the working of the Holy Spirit 
through the means of grace, the gospel in word and sacrament. The grace of God works through the law and the gospel to turn us from sin and back to faith. You, righteous believer, you have peace with God. Even while you have affliction and trouble in this world, because you live in the Spirit and because the Spirit lives in you. The unrighteous may seem to momentarily have peace with the world, but he only has affliction and trouble from God because he lives in the flesh and not in the Spirit. And just as the Spirit is eternal, we will have eternal peace for all the righteous, for believers, and there will be eternal trouble for unbelievers. The flesh, just all by itself, is just temporal. And so the troubles of believers will be brief, just as the peace of unbelievers will only be brief. But our true peace is eternal. Christ has given us true peace forever with his own blood covering over our sins. So believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, and Show your faith in Jesus with your life. Live in his everlasting peace that transcends our understanding and guards our hearts and our minds. In Christ Jesus, amen. Some of the last pieces to be written uh, in, in, the, in the scriptures are the letters of the apostle John and uh, a repeating line he has in his longer epistle is little children love one another. And as we think about our stewardship of everything God gives us, our time, our talents, and so on, we also think about that most precious of treasures, our loved ones, whether they are your children or your parents or your friends or your siblings or whomever it is, look to their spiritual welfare. Think about it. Pray about it. Dear children, love one another.